Good evening. My name is Tom Giroux and I'm with the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. I'm on the board of directors and I wanted to welcome you here tonight to this webinar. Uh, the title of our webinar is The, Lost, Lo the Last Log Drive, 1912 on the Wisconsin River. Uh, a little bit about the Forest History Association before we kick it off. You can see our mission here is to inform, educate, archive, and publish. Uh, so uh, we've been doing these uh, monthly uh, webinars, took a little break for the summertime, but we're back now for the fall and the rest of the winter. Uh, and tonight, like I said, is the last log drive on the Wisconsin River. And I'm pleased to welcome Ben Clark uh, from the Marathon County uh, Historical Society to give this presentation. He's going to do a little introduction here and uh, we'll kick it off. So welcome, Ben. Yeah, well, thank you for, so much for having me. I'm just gonna turn my, my phone off so I don't get interrupted here. Just a second here, there we go. Um, yeah, so, um, and let me um, go to the full thing here. Um, I think uh, if, if those of you who are watching, if you want to make sure that uh, my uh, window is, is pinned, then you can see the slides in full. Um, I'm not sure if that always is the case. Anyway, yeah, all right, so. Uh, if you click the view and put it on speaker view, you get the best view of all. So go ahead, Ben. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, yeah, well, like, uh, as, as I said, um, I'm, I'm Ben Clark. I'm from the uh, Marathon County Historical Society, uh, where I am the head archivist and uh, historian. And um, we do a, a weekly, weekly live stream uh, for the last two years we've been doing called History Chats. Um, and this is actually a program that was put together for, you know, that, that weekly live stream from a, a while ago. Um, but it's a, it's a really cool, cool topic. Uh, so we, we typically will do like a monthly theme and then we'll, um, you know, uh, divvy it up. Uh, myself or, or Gary Gissiman, some of you may know Gary, um, as, uh, you know, we kind of go back and forth and sometimes get some guests in. And this month we decided to do some lasts, uh, which was just kind of a nice framing mechanism to talk about some last stuff. And I kind of wanted to do something with this photograph. Um, well, not that photograph necessarily, but um, this one. There. Um, so this is the break room of the Marathon County Historical Society uh, the museum here. Um, now I, I didn't pivot the camera when I was filming this, but if I did, you'd see a bunch of different pictures on the wall, including the one that you, you see here. Um, these were all reproduced at some point, maybe in the 80s or 90s, I'm not entirely clear, but in the year 2000, they were donated to us from the, um, the University of Wisconsin uh, extension here in Marathon County. And they kind of sat around for about 10 years until we put them up on the wall and, and you know, our break room. Um, I wasn't here for that point, but uh, for years I had been sitting have been sitting and you know having my breaks, my lunch, you know having a cup of tea, maybe talking to a coworker or a volunteer, and you know, seeing this picture, and I was I was very very intrigued about what it was. Um, and in the last year, I've I've come to unravel the story behind it, which is really really interesting. Um, so this is the the photograph, and a little bit bit closer here. Um, well, this is the original. It, it's cropped a little bit for the reproduction. Um, and I'm cropping it a little bit so that it fits on the screen a little bit better, but um, you're not missing much of the, the top and the bottom there. Um, I didn't really know what it was, just like obviously the, the stuff that was hung in the break room doesn't have like a big title on it. So, uh, but I found some photographs. And in fact, we not only have um, the photograph that was, this was reproduced from, we have a couple of reproductions um, in our archives, um, as well as two original prints and an original negative. And from the original prints, um, there are some labels, which identify this as being fairly clearly the last log drive. Well, between the two, we can come to the understanding of this is the last log drive or log drive on the Wisconsin River, and it's dated 1912. So this is an interesting concept. And like I said, it's not even more uh, surprising as I, as I came across the folder with all of these, you know, with this stuff in it. It wasn't the only one, in fact, there's a whole series of photographs that were taken at the same time, um, as you can see here. And you know, I know it's the same time, it's the same format of the photographs and negatives, 
Um, I know it was the same time because of the, you know, the boats, the, the equipment that they're using, the location. I'm not entirely sure where they are. I'm going to take it on, um, you know, on, on, on the, the, the author of that original uh, labeling that this is on the Wisconsin River. It's, it's changed a bit since then. Um, and of course, some of the people here make appearances. And so we can kind of consistently say, yeah, this is, this is a log drive and some photographs that were taken of it. Um, and then there's these six, and then there was actually another three on the bank of the river, um, you know, having a little lunch or breakfast, or I'm not entirely sure what time of day this was, was photographed. So there's, there's clearly a really interesting story here. And I thought this would make for a great, I mean, I think it does make for an interesting topic to understand a bunch of different things. So I think first, for those of you who may be not familiar, uh, before we dig into the last log drive and whether it is or where it is and all of these things, when it is, do we know what a log drive is? Well, so here I'm going to employ um, the work of L.G. Sorden and uh, Isabel Ebert. They wrote a book, let's see here, uh, apparently um, they had been independently kind of been really interested in, in the like the 1920s and 30s. They were keeping track of the, the jargon and the language that was used by loggers, which has its own, you know, sort of uh, sensibility there. And um, they published this book in 1956. And it's a, it's a whole directory. Um, let's see here. Let me go back to the, so, you know, of just topics, a glossary essentially of terms. So they just, they did, they did um, in this book, um, and actually, uh, while I'm talking about some sources here, um, it was followed up a few years, about a decade later by um, Sorden published his own version of this, which added quite a few more um, things, as well as some, some illustrations, um, you know, things like that. So he adds some stuff to this, but between them, basically the, the gist of what, a, what is a log drive, right? Well, a log drive, is the transporting of logs from the woods to a sawmill by going down a stream or a river. So basically, you're going to cut down these trees, you know, go out into the pinery, we're going to cut down all these great white pines, and maybe there's a smattering of other uh, types of trees that you might be, be cutting. Um, we're going to throw those in the river because they're going to float, and how else are you going to get them to, to market to the sawmill? You're going to float those down the river until they get to a sawmill, you know, maybe here in Wassa, where I'm speaking from you, uh, or, you know, a handful of other places along the river. Um, and then you're going to cut them down to boards. And that, that process was a really important part, starting with the, you know, the 18, late 1830s, early 1840s, when you start to see settlement here. It's, it's largely around the river because that's how we get in and out. And that's how we get these, these resources out. So. These then, this is then is a log drive, and these are log drivers. That's what makes sense, right? These are the people, um, and, and obviously the guys in the suits who are a little older, maybe a different, we'll talk about them in a bit. Um, but for, for the most part, you know, we are looking here at log drivers, right? Or again, um, you know, employing um, Sorden and Ebert. Um, they've also go by a lot of different names. Caddy men, river pigs, river hogs, river rats, river jacks, and river drivers are all listed as, you know, uh, synonyms. They did have a theme there. Um, I also note, uh, I, I've been colorizing a couple of these. I, I just felt like doing it. So uh, you might see some color I'd added that's not original to the photograph. Anyway, so log drivers, these are the guys who have the job, the difficult and unenviable job um, of going along with the logs. You're gonna throw them in the river, you know, get those to market that way. Well, you, we want to make sure that they're going to get there in one piece, that we're not going to have, you know, issues in that regard of um, them getting lost or worse, you know, getting tangled and then the whole river gets caught up. And so all of that very, you know, the currency, I mean, literally people worked for their share of the lumber. That was your pay. You want to make sure that that gets to market so that you can get, you know, make something with it. Um, there's a couple other interesting things that are in these pictures that I wanted to, to, to kind of point out for those maybe not familiar. Um, this is a Wanigan. Um, interestingly, um, there's a bunch of different spellings of it. Um, it originally goes back to an Ojibwe word uh, meaning Wanakan, I think it's pronounced. It's basically supply pit, the pit, the pit where you put stuff. And um, there's other in, in, um, interesting uh, iterations of this. Uh, I, I think like up in Alaska and parts of Canada, they call um, like mobile homes a Wanigan, um, which is interesting. Um, 
here again, there's some, some, another angle here. You can see the, the, like the, the cooking equipment and everything else in here. Um, and again, I'm gonna just kind of focus in here. There's a bunch of different iterations in different places, but uh, they note that in Wisconsin in particular, it was often used for the cook's raft, which went down the river behind the logs. So, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're gonna be going hours at a time down the river to, to make sure the logs, it's, it's, it's hard work. It's a lot of dangerous work. You know, you can't just say, all right, guys, I'm gonna, you know, hang out. I'm gonna go into the bank of the river and, you know, make a sandwich, maybe take a nap for a little bit. Like you can't do that. By the time that you're done, logs are long past. So you need something that's gonna take all of your equipment. And often there's a component here of like pay or places like that. Um, I'm not sure how much of that would have been in this instance. Um, I will note one interesting thing here is that sometimes you see Wanigans in other parts of Wisconsin or the Midwest that are much like more sturdy. Um, this sort of cloth, like it's almost like a tent that's built on top of some log, a log raft. Um, that is something that you, you, you see a lot more in central Wisconsin in particular. Um, and I, my guess is uh, it compared to like on, on the Mississippi River, you know, the, the logging that happens near La Crosse up through the Chippewa Valley, often you will see um, uh, Wanigans that are like wooden shacks, like much more permanent structures. Um, but I'm guessing that, uh, you know, maybe there's less rapids, there's less worries that you have to go portage around things as opposed to what you had to deal with here. Anyway, just an interesting thing. You see, you see this form of, of Wanigan a lot on the Wisconsin River uh, from what I can see. So yeah, Wanigans, right? That's cool. Um, there's some other stuff in here too. Uh, oh, where's my cursor? There it is. So there's a bateau. It's also evident in these. Now, this, this, this actually kind of is, is a little misleading because they have the bateau, which is this boat in front here, lashed to the Wanigan. I think so these guys don't have to worry about falling in. Um, not that they're too far off the coast. A lot of these, I'm, I'm pretty sure these are like staged if, if you haven't caught on about that. This is not an authentic uh, scene that you would see. Um, but the bateau is the boat in front. Usually that would not be tethered. Um, it's a, it's a, as you might guess from the, the, the name, a bateau is French. It's a French boat uh, from Fre the French Canadian uh, fur traders would often use this as it brought over into the logging industry. Um, these are boats that have a flat bottom um, and long tapered ends. And the flat bottom gave it stability and the ends allowed them to maneuver really easily. And so you have these guys on either side here that have what's called, oh, there's the bateau. Thank you. Um, and then you see the punt poles. That's what they're using here to maneuver the boat. Kind of like, um, you know, those, 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 those gondolas in Vienna, Vien um, not Vienna, in, uh, Venice, you know, like those sort of famous, you know, you got the, the pole, your it's long pole, you push it to get to the, the bottom and then you're able to push off. And that's how they were able to propel the boat. Um, and this, this basically would be used if, you know, if you're, if you're going along and all of a sudden you can see way out in front of you, oh, there's a bunch of logs that are about to get caught and we need to stop that before all of the rest of the logs get caught up in there and we have a log jam. Um, you, this would allow you to kind of nimbly get around and get to the front. And then in between, you would have men, um, you know, I think four to eight, 10 men, how many you needed. Um, and they would be armed with, with hooks um, and they would then dislodge and, and you know, maneuver the logs to keep everything going. Um, and they would use these kind of hooks. Um, now, interestingly, I, for until I did the research for this, I always would have called these cant hooks, but turns out cant hook and PV hooks are different. So cant hooks, um, as you can see from the illustration here, it's not a full cap. You know, you still have the, the wooden, um, you know, hand, you know uh, stick, basically, long stick there, probably a better word than stick, um, but it's not a full cap like it is on the PV hook which gave the PV hook a bit a little bit more strength um, and allowed you to do some more stuff with it. Uh, PV hooks tend to be used um, on the water, whereas cant hooks are much more common on land. Um, so just a fun bit of trivia there. So you got punt poles and hooks, and then there's whatever this is. And if I'm honest, this is the thing that often caught my attention. One of the two things that caught my attention when I would be sitting at lunch or, or you know, taking a break and looking at this, this picture on the wall. Because this is a strange thing. It kind of looks like it's a punt pole, right? It's, you know, that's kind of how he's using it. And yet there's that sort of like nail-like, I don't know if you can, you can quite see that. Um, let's see, can I make it a little bit bigger for you? Oop. 
don't know if that's better or not. Um, but there's this like weird thing. It's like a, a nail or a scythe or something. And it looks like it could be a lumber implement. You know, they had some weird stuff. But I was always curious, right? Um, and I would ask people and they were like, eh, I don't know if that is a thing. It's not something I've seen. And so as I looked into it, I actually came up with an uh, um, a, a, a actual answer. Because um, remember, I had the original negative. Um, this is actually a scratch. Um, I kind of suspected that might be the case, but it wasn't on any of the prints or the reprints that that thing in our in our break room was made from. It's literally on the negative itself. Um, I had, um, that's right, I think I have a circle here. There we go. Um, I had one of our uh, volunteers, uh, Bob Sanders, who's a forensic photographer, retired at this point, worked in the crime lab and, you know, has that expertise with photo negatives. And so he he came in one day with all his equipment and he he looked at the actual negative and, and, and said, yes, this is, he verified that it in fact was a scratch on the negative. Um, and in his opinion, it makes a lot of sense that you could just easily, you know, when you're, when you're developing, you have all of these, these flimsy pieces, you know, of, you know, the negatives, right. Um, and you're in the wet, in the, 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 the process of developing, and you could just easily give it a little, you know, you can accidentally without even notice it, the corner of one could just just slightly remove some of the emulsion on another, which he thinks is probably what happens here. And of course, because of that, when you remove the emulsion, it's gonna remove that dark um, element there that when you make it a positive image, means it's gonna be a, you know, a very crisp line. So this isn't something that was on the lens or anything like that. This was actually in the process of making it. So something I didn't mention up to this point um, is that while we have a bunch of these things, so does the State Historical Society. This is a uh, record from, from their, their online records here. Um, and this is a, a picture. And this is the exact, this is the same image, right? Um, there's no scratch, but it's the same composition. Um, they call it visiting log drive. Um, and if you look down here, it is a negative. It's an original negative, which is interesting because we have the original negative, right? Huh. Is there two original negatives? Again, I had to ask Bob and be like, "Is what's the deal? Is there is that is there a possibility there's two? Uh, but I actually didn't need to ask Bob because when I compared them, I realized, well, so like here is our image, right? Um, this is from the original negative. Here's their image. And again, it's a little fuzzier in part because of the, um, I just took it off the internet. I didn't go to the original to the source down in Madison. Um, but you can see that, you know, there's something off about this, right? And it's not just that I haven't lined this up correctly, because if you do, as I did, so you can see the, the pole here, if you're, if you're looking, that scratch appears and disappears. And it's not like everything is moving, it's just shifting perspective a little bit. These are actually, in fact, both original negatives, both taken at the exact same time, the exact same place of the exact same people, but they're about three and a half inches apart. And that's because these pictures were taken to make a photograph for stereoscopic viewing. In fact, this. But cool, right? Some of you may be aware of these. Um, this is actually the original here. Um, it's on a card. Um, and these are, are used to reproduce three dimensions, right? Um, some of you may be, you know, uh, the like viewfinders or, or not view. View, ma view masters, there it is, um, and things like that. Like there are other versions of this, you know, down to the three, you know, three D films and things like that. There's ways to, uh, you know, make something appear three D by having two cameras and you know doing things like this, and um, that's what they're doing here. So a little bit about this. Um, I believe that uh, almost certain this came from the collection of this man, um, Dr. Joseph F. Smith, who comes to Wassa. Uh, he had gone off to grad school and got married and he had actually gone and spent some time in Berlin, I believe, uh, working, uh, sort of doing some study um, uh, in surgery. And then he comes back to Wisconsin and he, he comes to Wausau in 1908, gets settled for a little while um, and he's taking pictures. He is, I mean, he's one of these really fascinating individuals in that, you know, his obituary does not mention some crazy things because he is so accomplished. He is so you know, he, he's involved in the, the creation and the running of St. Mary's. He serves on state medical boards and he does all of these great things. And they don't even mention the fact that he's a prolific photographer. I mean, in an amateur sense, right? He's not charging, it's not a studio, 
but he takes a lot of pictures, including, as you can see here, um, this is self-portrait in stereoscopic, you know, photographs. Um, he even actually does some film, which is interesting too. Here, by the way, is, is that, now this, I should say, um, I'm gonna go back so you don't end up get motion sick. Um, this is how you would normally view it with one of these. Again, some of you may be familiar with these. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, you take the, the card and you, you slit it into the slots here. Now, obviously this isn't gonna work because, here, I'll go to the full camera. This is not gonna work very well because this is one camera, but essentially when you look through here and you can you know, adjust it, get it closer or farther away here. Um, and it basically gives it a feeling of, of not quite three dimensions, but three dimensions as we see it, right? Um, these became very popular. I mean, we started basically trying to do this as soon as people figured out that they could take two dimensional images with cameras. They're like, yeah, it looks good, but it's not quite realistic. And so they tried to make that a thing. Um, it wasn't until like the, I think 1860s, these become super popular when you have this version. There's some early versions that gave people headaches looking at them, uh, but these were a lot more stable. And uh, throughout the 1800s, the into the 20th century, these were super popular, and you could buy, you know, cards. Um, I will say, by by the 20th century, by the time that you know th this picture is taken, by the time that Smith comes to Wassa, um, these are not necessarily the most cutting edge anymore. Although people are still definitely um, experimenting with them. So here's here again, you can kind of get that sense of, it's not quite what you see if you actually look through, but it, it gives you a little bit of the different perspectives there. Um, again, this is, this is what you would be using. It is essentially one camera. It's just got two lenses and apertures um, and two bits of negatives and it creates, and it basically set, uh, is it two or three? I think it's three and a half inches, which is the average human, or what they decided was the average width of human eyes between them. Um, and that's why there's the, the adjuster. So you can kind of, you know, make sense of that. Um, so there you go. That's what this is. And, and so inter interestingly, when the family, and again, I'll, I'll bring up the record here, when J Dr. Smith's estate was looking at all of his, his stuff, uh, they donated part of it to us and also part of it to the State Historical Society. Again, Dr. Joseph Smith, it's in their collection. Um, I pulled these out of um, the Dr. Smith stereoscopic Stereopticon, I think is what they labeled it. Well, that's a different thing. Uh, collection. This is this is Dr. Smith's collection. So basically what they did is they, they took the negatives and they gave one to us and one to them. So even though I didn't know until I came across this that there was another image out there, and again, looking at the State Historical Society's uh, description, there's no indication that they, they know that it is a thing, but there's a connection there. So that's kind of a cool bit of, you know, historical forensic, uh, you know, detective work that I got to do. Um, which is always fun. Okay, that's fun, but we're kind of procrastinating here. Is this indeed the last log drive? We've established it's a log drive, even if it's a little staged. Is it an actual last log drive? Well, the date that's on these pictures, both here in our collection on the physical ones, as well as down at the state, is 1912. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if that's exactly correct, but we're gonna assume it's kind of correct, right? Uh, Dr. Smith doesn't start taking pictures until about 1910 outside of his family. Um, from what I can see, both again, from their collection and mine um, and ours, I should say, um, we, we don't really see much more than family photos until about 1910. Um, so it's, it's roughly there, right? Is it the last log drive? Well, okay. It patently isn't, it absolutely isn't the last one. This is um, from 1925. Um, and it's talking about the closing of the John Weeks uh, sawmill down in Stevens Point. Um, and yeah, in, in 1925 was the last time that they had pulled, uh, uh, done any, any um, log driving. And I, maybe somewhere else on the Wisconsin River, they continued well after 1925, I can't imagine. Um, by the turn of the century, basically nobody did this. Uh, railroads made it so much more efficient to transport people um, and, and logs to sawmills uh, to the point where like the mills in Wausau were often, uh, you know, cutting logs that had been cut outside of Wisconsin. You know, they were, they were shipping logs just because we had great water power here. Um, so yeah, they're not doing a whole lot, especially as, you know, the 20th century, we start to see dams being built and bridges and things like that, that would make it kind of difficult to take any, you know, of, of the golden age, right? So yeah, 1925, um, I mean, I know that Knowlton, 
Um, and there's another article which I should have put up here. Um, Knowlton, the community in Marathon County, talks about it. That you know, in the Daily Herald, they're saying like it's weird. This is the first time we haven't seen a Wanigan going down the river, or you know, these these caddy men taking the logs down. Um, so, yeah, it's not 1912. Then isn't the last log drive? But is there an explanation here? Why did they say it was? Well, remember I talked about these guys in suits. These guys. I thought, okay, well, let's look at them. I, I am not going to be able to identify the cook or the guys working the logs in the background, but some of these guys look kind of familiar, right? And one of the other things that I was looking at that picture down, down I'm in the second floor of the building right now, um, in the break room of the, the museum, I was, I was looking at one of these guys in particular going, huh, I think I know who that guy is, but I'm not sure. So next step, let's see if I can identify any of them. Now, I think I have kind of an idea here. I think that this is likely C.S. Gilbert, although he's probably the one I'm least confident in. Um, facial structure kind of fits, although the nose isn't quite right. It, it's hard to know. A um, little bit more sure of Hiram Stewart, he of the Barker Stewart Logging Company um, um, or Barker Stewart Island fame. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Barker would have died a few years earlier, and so he was around and I think got said, hey, come on down and we'll, we'll get a one again out. We'll, you know, take some pictures. I think the other two guys are the really important part, though, because it, these two guys are the ones that are posing together. The, you know, Gilbert and, and Stuart, if those are really who they are, they are in some of the pictures as a group, but these guys are together. And I know that this guy, the second from the right, is Walter Alexander. I'm confident that's who that is. We have enough pictures to corroborate that, yes, this is him. Uh, Walter Alexander was a fairly prominent lumberman here. Um, he had come and, and basically become the protege and working for, and eventually worked his way to become part of the company uh, of the Alexander Stewart Lumber Company. Um, Alexander Stewart being one of the, the early pioneers that really kind of developed the area in Wausau. Um, and Walter Alexander by this point, you know, would have, you know, just like a lot of, like, like Stewart, like a lot of the other lumber barons in the Wassa area had, you know, switched over largely to, um, you know, paper, you know, they big invest in the paper mills, um, in the um, insurance, in utilities, in some manufacturing of like electric motors, Marathon Electric, places like that. Um, this is the group that we might call the Wassa group, right? So Walter Alexander, who is this other guy though, right? You know, these guys are connected. There's Walter. Who's this? Now, this is the guy that I was very curious about because this guy in the picture, in the break room, I would wonder who is this? And, and you know, talking to Gary and other people, we all kind of just assumed that this was a man that I just mentioned, Alexander Stewart. There's a similarity there, right? There's the goatee, there's the, well, as it turns out, um, looking at the other pictures, it turns out not to be a goatee. It's, it's not a beard, it's actually just a mustache. Um, but the tr trick of the light you can see on top, it kind of looks like it is. But okay, does that disqualify him? You know, let's let's say for a second he just shaved off his beard and just left the mustache. Maybe, you know, that's a thing you could do. Well, Alexander Stewart, let's just talk about him for a second. He in um he comes to Wassa. Actually, let's back up. He was uh from a Scottish family. Um, he was born and raised uh in, in New Brunswick, Canada. And when he was a, a teenager, I believe, he and his family moved to Illinois, come to the United States. And as he sets off for himself around 1849, 1849, he comes up to Wausau. He had spent some of his formative years as a teenager working in the pineries of New Brunswick. And now he sets off for the great central pinery of central Wisconsin, along the Wisconsin River Valley. And so he comes up to, it's not even Wausau at that point. Wausau doesn't get its name Wausau until 1850. So he comes up to Big Bull Falls and he gets a job and he spends two years working. And like I said, you get paid in lumber and he did. After two years of cutting trees and you know rafting them down and milling them, uh, he makes a raft and by himself pilots that lumber down to St. Louis, which is at that point the, the center of a lot of the, you know, uh, the lumber industry. Um, he uses the profits, does it again, it brings his brother John up um, in the early 1850s. Uh, before long, they have their own company, the Alexander Stewart Lumber Company. And uh, John doesn't stick around. He goes back to Illinois for most of his life after that. Um, 
but but yeah, here's here's Alexander, and and he not only is just going to be an important figure, um, and I guess I should say they bring in Walter, uh, Walter Alexander, uh, you know, from over here. Um, they, he gets brought in as the third member of the company um, in in I think the 1880s, 90s, somewhere in there. Um, oh, and also here's here's some other pictures of him, a little younger. Again, always wore the beard. Interesting, uh, especially at a time where mustaches were popular. And when mustaches fell out of popularity, you know, did he shave it up? I don't know. Anyway, like I said, he he then not only becomes an important businessman in the area, he's also gets involved in politics and as a city leader. Like he literally is elected to the the the, the Congress in Washington D.C. Spends some time there. Um, in fact, here's a here's a fun fact. Um, he and his wife, his family, build a house in Washington while he's he's there. Um, a house that, uh, you know, after their deaths um, gets passed along until it eventually ends up in the hands of the family during World War One. I. I think it's World War One of uh, the royal, uh, the royal royalty of Luxembourg, um, and that house, which is right here, you can uh, better. Oh, yep. Just look at it. This is to this day the embassy in Washington D.C. The embassy of Luxembourg. This was built by. Uh, a Wasa guy, the lumber baron, um, well, uh, Alexander Stewart. So that's interesting, right? Um, again, as as the new century, he and the other Wasa group guys, they they see the need to pivot towards other industries, and he's involved. And here's where it gets a little iffy. Remember, I said that 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 Alexander or um, uh, Doctor Smith, the photographer, right, who took these. He doesn't really start doing non you know family stuff until about 1910 at Wasa. Well, in 1910, Alexander Stewart, along with some other board members of this new industry, the, the paper company down in Rothschild, Marathon Paper, um, he goes to, to tour the progress as they're building their new paper uh, mill. And um, it would probably be really interesting to, to, to pick his brain in that moment because you know here's a guy who did do log drives, right? He was one of those guys that as, as he, he did the work. He didn't just have money and invest in lumber and you know, uh, get involved in an administrative capacity. He was a lumberjack, maybe one of the last left from that era. And he was then having to watch and he toured him. Here's the dam that, you know, 40 years earlier, 50 years earlier, back when, when the, the heyday of the lumber industry was happening, before the railroads really can take over, you couldn't, I mean, it was illegal to block the Wisconsin River. It needed to be open for, for get stuff in and out. And here they were in charge of a company that was building one of the most ambitious dams uh, in this area. And while he's touring this, his footing, at this point, in, he's in his mid-80s, I think, certainly in his 80s, uh, his footing gets off from underneath him. He steps on some bad, you know, so there's a, like a boulder or something, and he slips and he breaks his arm right be, be underneath the right shoulder. And um, yeah, he, he goes home, he starts to recover, and, and here's where it gets interesting because he spends about the next year and a half really just not out in the public. He's still, you know, he's not healing as well as he did and it's not looking good. Um, by, this, by the winter of uh, 1911, so about a year later, um, year and a half later, um, his family and friends convince him to go back to the, you know, the home in Washington, DC. They're, they're concerned that the cold of the oncoming winter, which was pretty bitter at that point, you know, wouldn't be good for him. So he goes and he moves to Washington, D.C., you know, back to the embassy. And um, yeah, he, he never really recovers. Um, he, he makes it, I think, in, in February, May of, of 1912, uh, he finally, finally does pass away. And, you know, they bring his body back to Wausau. And it's, it's like one of the biggest funerals that we've ever had. Everybody comes out to pay their respects to Alexander Stewart. So the idea that this is him in a photograph that's taken in 1912 or 1913, even if we expand it to go back to 1911, 1910, this guy doesn't have a broken arm. So this probably isn't him. But then I got to thinking, and I was like, all right, well, if it's not Alexander Stewart, I can't find anybody else in the time that would have been in Wausau living here that would fit this book, especially somebody so connected to Walter Alexander that they wanted to, you know, have them featured. Except maybe John Stewart. Remember John? I, I mentioned the, his his older brother, Alexander Stewart's older brother, uh, who comes up in the 1850s to Wassa. 
Um, and then he goes back to Illinois and he becomes a banker and involved in politics as well. Still one of the, the key people is like the treasurer, the financial guy for the Alexander Stewart Lumber Company. So here's where I was like, oh, okay. Well, he's here in Wausau in 1912 and he comes back in 1913. Uh, in, in 1912 to, you know, for the funeral of his brother. And then in 1913, he comes back just to see his family. He, the death of his brother probably shook him from what I, I can tell, um, his younger brother. Um, he's also in declining health. And he says, you know, hey, I, I don't wanna you know, be buried with my millions of dollars. And so he starts to just, it's interesting because you know, he, he has this reputation of just going and being like, here's a couple hundred thousand dollars to charitable causes, to friends, to family comes back up to Wausau in 1913. Um, I think I, I calculated that by the time that he died, um, he had basically over the last three, four years had given away the equivalent of like two and a half billion dollars. And he still had in his estate like a million and a half, uh, again, in 1915 money. But anyway, interesting diversion. He's here in 1912 and in 1913 visiting. So maybe it's him. And so I went, okay, well, let's see if I can find pictures of him. We don't have pictures of him. I reached out to a bunch of people uh, down in Illinois, historical societies, so the places that he lived, and presumably they would have, you know, known him, right? He's a he's a banker, he's a politician down there. Nobody got back to me. So my original version of this program I did, I I just had an image that said, oh, yep, don't know who he looks like, but we'll just move on. Um, and seeing that, uh, Don Schnitzler, um, of the organization here. Um, he, he got in touch. He's like, hey, here's two pictures of him. And so, yeah, he found them um, online. I think that it's, a, again, he, he's a bearded gentleman in these pictures, but I can see the, the resemblance is still here. Um, his eyes work, his nose kind of fits. I'm willing to say that in all likelihood, this is probably John Stewart. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Well, that means that this is probably, this picture was taken in 12 or 13, right? But this doesn't actually help solve the question, is this the last log drive or not? So for that, um, I don't know, maybe it's somebody else. What, what can we do? Well, here's the thing. In 1912, for any of you who are you know, aware of the history of the river or you know, this, this era, um, you might know that we had one of the, probably the most damaging destructive floods that we've ever had on the Wisconsin River in 1912. This is, this is uh, the following day, um, you know, downtown Wausau. You can see the, the river raging. Um, over the course of, and, and I, I've done a whole thing on this, uh, you know, on a, a video about the, the really fascinating story of, of the, the flood. They didn't know it was coming. Um, it really wasn't raining that heavily, it, you know, mostly upriver it was. And so they go, everybody goes to bed in Wausau going, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. It's a convention in town. That's exciting. Meanwhile, up in Merrill, they're frantically trying to, you know, phone down here saying, hey, there's a flood coming and it's wrecking havoc. And as it continues to go down, um, they, they actually, I don't think they actually get a hold of Wausau because the telephone lines have been damaged. They get a hold of Brokaw, who then, you know, let them down. At Brokaw, they managed to get out there and save everything. They managed to, to, to get the dam gates open to let the water through, which would have, if they didn't, it would have washed them away. But this water continues to go, being fed in by more tributaries. And eventually it gets to the Wassa area. And, you know, this is, again, the following day, it's in pitch black. There's just thunder and lightning. The only thing you can hear is the squall of the storm and the banging of all the refuge that's being dragged in the wake of the, of the water. And, um, you know, Kickbush has his grocery store. All of these cartloads of produce is just washed away. Uh, there's some interesting stories about how the following day, kids down in Schofield would you know, take makeshift harpoons made out of, you know, broom handles they sharpened and they would go out into the water and they were, you know, trying to catch watermelons that were just floating down the river. Um, again, there's, uh, you know, some heroism in the middle of the night. They, they managed to get the, some, some logs on carts out onto the railroad bridge, which keeps it from getting washed away. It, nobody died, which is, which is amazing. Um, but the following day, everybody was out taking pictures, including, I think, um, Dr. Joseph Smith. I think this maybe is his work. I, I can't guarantee it like I can the other ones, but here I'll put that to the here, here. And I think this is maybe his daughter, Ooh, his daughter, um, about the right age. Um, this, unfortunately, it's, it's a little different, you know, compare that to, to that. 
you know, just the way it's produced, but, you know, I don't know. If nothing else, I think this is probably the most ph photographed day in the history of Wassa relative to the number of cameras that could have been out. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Now, the thing to, to keep in mind about this is in the aftermath of this flood, remember it hit Brokaw. Brokaw wasn't, uh, I mean, there were, there were I, I don't remember the specific number, but there were like millions of board feet worth of lumber that was just sitting waiting to be turned into pulp at Brokaw. And as the water came through, it just grabbed all of that and everything along its path and just kept going. And as it went, you know, the water's higher. Some of these logs got deposited on, you know, little lands around the area or, you know, whatever, got caught up on things. And so over the next two years, they have to um, go out and, you know, we got to get our investment back. And so here's the Wassa pilot article from May uh, of 1913, but a year later, less than a year later, where they talk about the last log drive, how the Wassa paper mills company and various sawmills in the city finished cleaning up a drive about a million feet of logs between Wassa and Brokaw. The logs broke loose from the booms at the time of the high water last July and floated over the banks of the river onto the lowlands. It has been a slow and difficult task to get them back and finally to the mills. Hereafter, there will be no more logs floated down the Wisconsin River to Wassa, so the mill owners intend to have all delivered by rail. So there you go. I think I think it is entirely possible. I, now again, again, I don't know if this is actually part like if they treated the the, the aftermath of the flood through this point in May of 1913 as the last log drive to get all this log back, or if it was literally you know here in May 1913. But that is as far as I know the story behind the last log drive in on the Wisconsin River, although not actually, but. Um, and, and I'm just going to hedge my bets and say it's either 1912 or 1913. Um, in all, I think, I think it's a really interesting story. I, I, again, I, I love stories like this because it allows me not only to tell an interesting story, you know, be a little educational about, hey, here's some, uh, some, some logging lore, here's some, some, some terminology, uh, things like that, and also, you know, show the process of it. History is a really interesting, uh, you know, process, not just the stories, but the, the process of learning about and, and sorting out all these details, it is very often messy and complicated. And so when we get a chance to be like, oh, here's the path that I took to get here, usually that's not really worth the time to explain. But here it's a really interesting story in and of itself. Um, so yeah, that's that's the story. Um, I'm just going to end here with a before I'm, I'm sure we're going to open up for comments and questions in a second. Um, I'm just going to put in a plug here. Um, like I said, I did this for our uh, our weekly live stream series that we do um, called um, History Chats. Uh, Gary Gissman and I do one every single Thursday. Um, and we have on our YouTube channel, all of them going back two plus years. Um, so if you're if you're curious, if you, you enjoyed this and you, you, know, you want some more central Wisconsin history here, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do. And, you know, hey, check it out if you want. All right. All right. Thanks, Ben. It was really informative. And I'm gonna, I always like being the moderator because I get to ask the first question. Yeah. Uh, uh, so was it uh, Dr. Smith, correct? Is that the right name? The yep, Dr. Joseph Smith. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think he did his own developing or did he, I mean, what during the yeah. period did people do their own or did they send it out? I, I think they definitely would have done their own. Um, is my understanding. Um, I mean, I guess you could send it out, but I think back then, you know, the handful of studios had their own stuff that they were taking care of. You know, you don't want to just bring in, say, because, because, you know, Colby might've been using glass plate negatives and Lacert might've been using sort of a different model of camera. And so it really was part of the, the process. And, and I think, you know, as someone like Dr. Smith, you know, he liked tinkering. He liked to kind of learn the process and, and to be able to do that. So I'm guessing that that was all, you know, you want to be able to develop your own photographs. So, yeah. And I see uh, uh, Don Snitzler is on our uh, uh, list here for a panelist. And I just would invite him to tell us about the process of finding the photographs for you. I thought that was a really interesting connection. Don? If he has his uh, 
He was having some technical issues with his uh, system, so maybe. I think oh. it's. I think everything is yeah. back up and running. Uh, first off, Ben, I just love the detective work that goes along with looking at a picture and mixing it with the logging history. I think that was great. Uh, as far as the picture of of, of J John John Stewart. Uh, when Ben mentioned in the History Chats presentation that he didn't have a picture, the first thing I thought about, check with the genealogist, and there's a nice collection of photographs for the Stewart family uh, connected to an ancestry account. Uh, and so there it was, and it was a matter of just copying him, sending it to him. Probably yeah. got him yet that afternoon, so. I will say the downside is because they were just posted by somebody on Ancestry, I don't have any verification because they didn't they didn't post where they came from. So I'm taking for, for we're taking for granted that they are, are actually doing their, their job correctly and citing, you know, this is the right person. But, um, you know, sometimes that's the way it works. Um, but I think I think the, the family resemblance is absolutely there and it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, that was a great piece of the puzzle missing there. Help to pull it all together. I'm going to encourage our participants to ask a few questions. You can either use the chat or Q&A function on the bottom, usually. If you're on an iPad, they're on the top, uh, and enter in a question there. I, the, the other comment that I would have about log drives is, you know, it was really the pinery that they were floating uh, in some of the softwoods. The hardwood, of course, you couldn't float. And, uh, you know, uh, about 1900, they made a transition, you know, because much of the pine was cut uh, and uh, they made the transition to hardwood, which didn't float and required railroads to get the logs even out of the woods. Uh, so well, just, just to add to that, I, I would say that, you know, while that is the case, I think by the turn of the century, they had made that transition. You actually see it a lot earlier. And it wasn't just that they had cut all the pine. It's the fact that now you can add a railroad jut and you can cut everything. You can yeah. cut the hemlock and the oak and all the stuff that may or may not float and just put it on a train cart and sort it out later. And that made it possible for them to, you know, I mean, it's so much more efficient um, to do it that way. Um, which, which again, then, then why would you float it down the river when there's a better way to get to it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that happened. I mean, the railroads show up in, I think the last, the other part of this is once they get it to the sawmill, they have to then make, make boards out of it. And then the question is, again, in the 1850s, how do you get the boards to market? Well, they're, you send them down the river. So they would make these big rafts out of the logs, uh, or that's not the logs, sorry, the lumber uh, uh, boards. And uh, that's what, you know, uh, Alexander Stewart had to do. Um, and the last one of those that they, basically in 1883, I think was the last one to leave Wausau. So they had basically transitioned immediately to, to, to the railroad. Um, yeah, it's fascinating I, I, to think back that way. I'm gonna butcher this, but there's a portion of our constitution that says the rivers are the highways and byways and forever free. Uh, and that's the, uh, the genesis of the rivers being available to the public for canoeing and recreating and stuff. Uh, but it's it's part of our constitution and history that uh, the waterways were the highways and byways because you have to remember there was no roads and very limited railroad. And so the only way to get from point A to point B was by water. Yeah. Um, and, and the sort of thing of like, if you wanted to, to even put like a boom dam, there, there's a really also no fascinating thing that I haven't really looked into as much as I'd like to, but there seems to be a kind of push and pull between the loggers and the log owners or the, the mill owners, because the mill owners were saying like, hey, all of this water is just kind of going past us. And if we could put like a, a little dam here just to kind of make it control it a little bit better, we could have such more efficient, you know, uh, mills. Uh, but then that would mean blocking the river travel. And so there was a long process where, you know, basically until the railroad shows up and suddenly you don't need that anymore uh, as much, you know, hey, yeah, you, you just good luck getting a dam in the Wisconsin River. It's just not a thing you can do. Yeah. And then of course, one, a lot of those dams were converted to mill power and even later uh, generating electricity uh, mm -hmm. over time. That's fascinating uh, history. And of course, the 
Wisconsin River flows the entire length of the state from you know Michigan all the way to the Prairie du Chien and the Mississippi River and you know some of the uh, products were actually shipped even further south to St. Louis and other places you know once the um, uh, wood was milled so it's a fascinating part of the history and it, uh, the other thing that you can watch is you know the uh, the mills kept jumping north you know they started at Stevens Point and then Wausau then Merrill then Rhinelander they were I think you know a lot of it was uh, trying to uh, capture the lumber sooner in the process well it's it's that and it's also getting close proximity to the lumber yeah. um I mean the interesting thing is that Wasa remains I mean again the once railroads enter the picture, you know, places like Wassa and Mosinee kind of closes down earlier. Stevens Point and John Weeks in, in Stevens Point, they're operating a long time after they stop, you know, floating down the river. Um, and, but it is in part just like, well, you know, as more people are moving further north, then it becomes feasible, especially with the railroad. You don't need to have all the lumberjacks hanging out in Wassa or Stevens Point. You can have them go up to Tomahawk and Rhinelander and uh, it's, it's actually kind of interesting because like it, Wasa is celebrating 150 years this year as a city. And so I did some, uh, uh, you know, program on that. And it was interesting going back because it was like, oh, the railroad makes Wasa respectable because all of the dis unrespectable parts of the community are now, they're up in Tomahawk. Uh, you know, you don't have guys in the streets brawling, uh, the lumber lumbermen. Um, so yeah, there's a, a Again, just to add to that fascinating kind of history about the developments, and it's all it all comes down to the river. Okay, Don, do you know what we have on deck for next month? Uh, we have a couple questions in the Q and A. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Three. Of um, them. Go ahead. Karen starts off with just a compliment that the research on this subject was really interesting and thought it was a wonderful presentation. And then the question has to do. Uh, the first question has to do with what were the entry points north of Wausau where the white pine logs were put into the river. And I, I think we could name a number of cities where they probably were, but I don't know for sure. So Tom or, or, or Ben, do you have any information about that? Yeah, um, and it kind of depended. Um, I think uh, different eras, they would just kind of drag them to, the, so, so uh, there are actually, I'm trying to see if I have, um, here, this is from a different program. I'll, I'll, I'll share my thing here. Oh, sorry, I guess it, it started from the beginning here. There we go. So, you know, they would cut down the trees here, put them on slids and, and, and in the winter, that's why a lot of the lumberjack camps were in winter. And then they would drag them to the, the riverbed waiting for it to thaw. And they wouldn't necessarily have to put it in a city. They would just dump them on the frozen water and just get it ready. And then once the river had thawed to the point where you could you know, get get logs down it, they would just dump them in and that's how they would then get them there. Um, now there there were other places you might, you, you know, the tributaries like the Trap River or the Eau Claire River, um, you know, uh, the Pine Pine River up in Lincoln County, you know, there were places that you could also then, you know, you, you didn't have to have a sawmill on that location. You could then take that to the, where it emptied into the Wisconsin and then take it down from there, um, but yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of those smaller tributaries, they'd build a, a small dam uh, and pile up the logs below the dam. Then in the spring, during the spring melt, they it was just a log dam. They'd uh, either blow it out or pull it out, and that would provide the flush of water necessary to get the logs down to a bigger river. So uh, they could use an amazingly small creek or stream to get the logs out. <coughs> Uh, using that technique of building a, a check dam, a wooden check dam upstream of the where the logs were piled. Uh, uh, you know, there's tons of uh, information you can talk about, including the practice of putting a stamp on the log so that they could identify whose log it was at the mill, that kind of stuff. So Don, is there another question? Well, the other question had to do in, uh, with uh, how the lumber was sent down the river. And I think Ben kind of talked about that with a lumber raft. Um, yeah, but actually, since I have the PowerPoint up, let me show you the other. Oh, here, you see that? 
Um, so this is them taking the logs down, but then once in, there's an interesting log jam uh, in 1880s, uh, but here. So this is an early picture of Wassa, and you can see them putting together rafts of lumber. Um, and so they would, they would basically use the logs that they were using to make a raft. Um, and interestingly, they had these, uh, these, these poles that they would use to kind of hold everything together. They wouldn't use like nails or anything because that would be really unnecessary. Um, and these, these poles, I, 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 don't, I can't remember that there was a name for these um, and I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, uh, but apparently these were used basically as currency. They were basically little, little bit of, um, you know, small trees that they would just pull out of the ground. Um, underneath there, they might even have like the, apparently there was just such a pain to harvest um, that they basically would trade in them as though it was currency. Um, and if a, a, you know, a trader came to town with an oxen with these on its side, then you knew that they were prosperous and they, you know, they could be trusted. Um, so just kind of interesting there. But then, yeah, like I, like I said, they would they'd make these, part of the reason that they had to be, you know, held together that way is because, you know, you can put together the rafts at Wassa, but once you get to Little Bull Falls in Mosinee, you don't want to take these rafts down. It's going to, it's going to, you know, one of the most deadly places on the on the Wisconsin River is, is Little Bull Falls at, at, Wasa, at Mosinee. So basically they would stop, disassemble the raft, move it around, reassemble it on the other side of the, the falls or, or other obstructions, and then they would keep going like that um, until eventually they hit the Mississippi River, and then they would take it down to the market from there. So the, there you go. The rafting was a, 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 an amazing feat at the time. Another question came in, um, just disappeared, but it had to do with the Peshtigo River and how far, uh, there, or there it went, how far up the Peshtigo River did they send the logs? And I know that's kind of out of our area, so. Yeah. So that one I think we, we won't be able to answer tonight, so. That'd be a question for the Ocano uh, county oh, history on. people, so. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It is a good sized river. I'm sure it was used for river drives. Right. It did extend up into the pinery. It's just, we don't know the specifics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how far they went up there, but I, I do know that that was, that area was, was maybe less part of the pinery and more, it was known as like the cedar lands. So I think they would have been I, I should I take this with a grain of salt as I'm not an expert uh, in any any sense of, of this, but I think maybe cedar was the main thing they were pulling out there. Um, but yeah, one of the kind of three primary areas, uh, kind of some interesting sometimes you think about like uh, the, the concept of central Wisconsin um, and what that means. Is that a north south thing? We kind of like, where's the divider? Um, and, and honestly, I think the original concept of central was not so much north south, but east west. Because you had the ways that you get at, at the lumber and the pinery, you had people coming up from the, the Great Lakes on the, the east side, you got people coming up from the Mississippi on the other side, and then you have the Wisconsin River going up the center. And that, that's kind of where the population ended up developing. Um, but yeah, so the, the Peshtigo River is kind of outside the central Wisconsin Valley, but uh, probably very similar thing there. Yeah, I do know the Wolf River was used extensively and a lot of the lo logs and stuff were shipped down to Oshkosh where they had large, uh, similar large mills, the same as uh, Wausau did. Yeah. So uh, Tom had started a question before about what's up for next month. Uh, next month, we're going to try to do something on Jack Valier's uh, Great Lakes logging photographs that were donated to the UWSP uh, kind of tell you a little bit more about that. And for tonight, I don't see any other questions. I want to say thanks to Ben for doing this. Uh, it was a great presentation. I'm sorry I missed the introduction. I was going to mention in case uh, it wasn't mentioned, if anyone is interested in learning more about Marathon County history, to make sure they check out the history speaks and the history chats because they're great presentations. And Ben mentioned history chats are every Thursday and history speaks are once a month on a Saturday. I don't remember what. what It moves around a little bit. Okay. Um, the, the last one we have this, this uh, year is actually going to be on November 12th. Um, and we're going to be talking about Dick Bong, uh, the ace of aces during World War II, the top American flyer. Um, and so we have a local expert on that. And so he's actually from Wisconsin. 
the, the, the flyer as well as the talk. Anyway, yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Ben. Uh, and thank everyone for joining us tonight. I hope to see you next month. Um, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but third Wednesday of November. Okay. I think, have a good night, everyone. I think you'll get a survey too. So please fill out the survey. If you have any ideas for future speakers, please let us know. Thanks.